morning. I'm trying a new angle with this junk to show you something. Uh, first, I was going to explain these uh, double bugs in chum Q form, where you push forward and then you strike down right above the clavicle to the pressure points here. If you touch yourself here, you can feel it hurts. So, application would be pock and strike, lop and strike. So I did it from a, I'll do it long later, but right now I'm in a side neutral stance. If you can't see my feet, I can't see the monitor because of the glare. So if the punch comes at you, you would step to the side, pock and strike, and step to the side again and lop because you want to get off the line of attack. The same thing if you were in a front stance. You would pock, step to the side to get off the line of attack, pock and strike, lop and strike. But that would be if the person punched at you. What if he had his guard like this? Now, this wouldn't work against a person who fought like this. This is for a person with a semi-closed or closed guard. So you would have to do a little bit of a lao sao to get to the outside of his arm if you were between his arms. So if you wanted to initiate that attack, you'd circle around so you'd have interruptibility. And if his arm was still there, then you would pock or gum and do the strike. So, see? So I circle around, <coughs> strike. If it comes at me, I just go right into it. This short arm is not going to really help me. I'm going to get closer. I wouldn't be this close. And I'm not square on right now. <coughs> I'm straight. I have the arm straight pointing at me. So if the punch comes at me, if I was in a side neutral, I'd half step, BG, lop. You can do an open hand lop. It's not really a lop. It's a cover. A lop actually means grab. But sometimes the person pulls their hand back too fast. You don't have a chance to close. So Sifu jokingly calls this half a lop. I don't think that's a real term, but I just call it half a lop, okay? So if the punch comes past my face, I just pock or gum, PUG, then lop and PUG. But if I'm here, notice how the arms are going out. They're out here. So I'd have to, if, sorry, the first one was he's attacking me. So if he's attacking me, then I have a, I just covered the line. But if I want to initiate the attack, I'm going to have to do a little bit of a lao sao to, before I attack, then strike. Same thing if I was in a front stance, I lao. And this lao gives me a chance to interrupt. Just like when you do a him go, you, you're able to interrupt your movement. You're not committed to one point in space. If I'm going to step forward, I don't step straight. If I'm in a side neutral stance, I still do a little bit of a lao sao. Uh, good thing I had my knees squeezed. I would have hyperextended. So that's why it's important to keep your knees squeezed. Like when you do sit on tau, my knees are squeezed in. When I do um, side neutral stance, my knees are squeezed in. When I go forward, they're squeezed in. This is a little damp here, so I would have slipped. Okay, so... If I'm in a side neutral stance, I don't step straight forward. I do a little bit of a hyun gurk so I can change. Same thing if I'm in a front stance. I do a little bit of a hyun gurk. So it gives me a chance to change direction. Same thing with this. If I want to initiate the attack, I'd circle around and then lop. So I'd, if I'm between his arms, I'd circle around and strike. Now that circle is important. <clears throat> for a couple of reasons. Now all Wing Chun lineages do this exercise I'm about to show you. They practice pock, pock, pock. Your opponent punches, sorry, you do a vertical pock like this. Because the person's punching this way and your pock slides along the, tr the path and it diverts their hand away, redirects their hand. Now that works good with a Wing Chun punch. Well, I'm doing our punch. Normally they punch this way, which makes it even easier. So if you punch with a vertical fist, it's easy to slide down. But what about the average fighter who punches 
like this with a horizontal fist. So I hope I can show this here like this. So say you're about to do this to an incoming punch, but you catch his arm when it's bent like this. You can actually end up hyperextending your, your wrist because, like I sh showed you, the punch is kind of bowed. Now say you catch him right here. If you catch him locked out, you, you might be okay. But depends on your timing, you may catch him here. So you end up, he's, he's punching and you pock and he's going to push your hand back. I hope I explained that right. When I get a partner, somebody to work with, I can show you. So, so I'm going to stand offline <coughs> from the jung. <coughs> I'm going straight. See, that's the drill you do in most Wing Chun lenses. Then you add a punch to it. Then you add a pock punch, pock punch. Uh, most Wing Chun styles do this. Even we teach this, pock punch. But if it's this punch, so say he punches and I catch him right there. And this is going to push against my hand. So, pock, pock, pock. So if I'm fighting the average fighter who doesn't do Wing Chun, I'm not going to do it straight down. If he throws a straight punch and I want to do a, a redirecting pock, I'm going to do a little bit of a circle. See? I hope I'm imparting this information right. I can explain it better with a partner. See? Instead of me just doing this, I go a little bit here so I don't cause trauma to my hand. If I catch him the wrong way, his force is going to push my wrist back. So that's what I'm trying to show you with the application for these uh, double BUGs. If I want to initiate the attack, I may have to go around to strike. If the attack comes at me, I just sidestep and pop. See? And since I'm sidestepping, I don't have to worry about the lao because I'm moving to the side. But if I was caught here... I may have to do a lao to get around so I don't um, get caught, uh, hyperextend my wrist. I hope that made sense. Okay. So, I'll go back to here, <coughs> double BUG. <coughs> now, I can do a jut. I can also do a pock. <coughs> the thing with the jut, you have to be more precise. Because in Silom Tao, we do double ton and then jut back. We do a little diagonal line back. So the tendency that most people would do where they would do this, and I'm bringing their hand down now. So if you do the jut, if you do the jut, you make, make sure you keep it up here, okay? Don't bring it down. I prefer the pock, that's my personal preference, because I knock the hand away. But the jut is good for this purpose. I can jut and then bew, because when you get the Selim Tao form, you jut and bew. So, I can jut and bew to the eye. <clears throat> so you can do both ways. Back here again. So we're getting back to... Uh, <clears throat> oh, here's what I wanted to show you guys. After you've done here, here, and you do this strike, from here, I can lao sao. Remember, if I have to go around the limb, I lao sao and palm strike, low or high. The form shows low. Or, if he pulls back, I can just press. <clears throat> but I can also, with the bong sao, lao, and I'll show you why. So, <clears throat> the first one is for a cross leg stance. So, when you're doing from here, 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 and you go forward, this is for... I'm cross-leg, I'm in the front stance. 
he throws with his right arm. I come back <coughs> and then strike. He throws his left hand. I circle around and then strike. Say we end up parallel. Okay, so he throws his left. Then I would do the bong. Making sense? If we're cross leg, he throws his right. So <clears throat> we're cross leg, he throws his right. I either circle around. So if you have a wooden wooden dummy with wooden arms, you simulate this by doing that. You push the hand down. Okay? So I go from here and strike. Here, circle around and strike if his arm is still there. If he's moved the arm back, just do the strike. <clears throat> but what if he throws his left arm? You're parallel. You step back. See the difference? I step here. Lao saw from the bong sao and strike. So these are some of the variables in the form. I had to put this hat on because of the sun. <coughs> so I am in a, say I'm in a <coughs> left front stance, he's in a right front stance. He punches. My hand's on the inside of his arm, right? I circle around, pock, and strike. It would be over here. Okay, because I want my forearm over the back of my hand. So from here, I circle around and strike. If he pulls his hand back, I just push down. I got to move it over and strike. So if he moved the hand back, so I can do that better with the short arm. <clears throat> So he moves, I step back, he moves his hand back, I follow it in. See? If it's still out here, I circle around and strike. But if he moves back, I just follow it in. But what if it's, so we're parallel now. So, I can edit this out. So, I'm in a right front stance, my opponent's in a right front stance. See? So now, I do the bong sao to do the lao and strike. See the difference? Now, if he pulls his hand back, I just press and strike. So if he pulls his hand back, I just pin. See? I just pin and strike. If his arm is still there from the bong sao, I lao to do the gum sao. If his arm pulls back, I just pin and strike. See, I did that again. Remember I was telling you guys about keeping the elbow down? I've done this for so many years, I keep doing this. So I gotta focus on that to correct my wing chun. And then strike. Bong. Pulls it back, I pin it back to his body. His arm's still there, circle around. So you've got cross leg, the short arm or the Wu hand does the Lao and Gam or just the Gam. Parallel, the Bong Sao hand does it. So the, see, the Chum Q form only shows you the cross arm version of this drill. If you look at this line, Forget my hands. I want to step forward from my side neutral stance to a front. I don't just do this because I left this line open. Right? So, see? I go here in case I have to pull back. So, for those of you who don't know, if you think of a plum flower jong, five poles, usually five, six feet above the ground, and people would stand on them and do forms and sometimes even spar. So if I'm on a number five domino, I got two pips here, 
one pip there, one pip here, one pip here. So I'm on the bottom two dots or pips of the domino. I trace here and then step to that one. When I come back, I do the same thing. I go here and then there. When I come back, I do the same thing. I don't just do this. So if I'm fighting, I just step forward and the guy just kicks me in my nuts. I want to make sure I cover my groin, or cover the line. So this is too wide for me, but at least you can see me standing on these two lines. So my toes are fading away, facing away to the upper right hand corner of my imaginary square. So some people work better envisioning a square here or you could you know, imagine a square on the ground. It doesn't matter. My center and my toes are facing this way. Now, really, this foot should be facing more straight. But Grandmaster used to just teach everybody this way so people don't get their feet all askew and go crazy. Really, this foot should be pointing there and this one straight. Almost like the character eight in Chinese. See, this foot should be straight. Not open like that, but straight. So anyway, I imagine the dot here, I pass over that dot and then land here. And the reason I do that is because I step forward to attack the guy, he pulls out a knife. I go, oh, I can at least move back because I stepped on that pole on the Mui Fa Jong, the plum flower poles. See, and I can move back. If I just do here, I'm cut because I can't move back until I land. I don't have interruptibility. So remember, this is one of the things you should practice as a beginner. Step forward, step back. And when I step forward, this hand doesn't waver. Now you're going to move a little bit because you're human. But um, I'm going to try to follow this line here. I'm going to do the best I can. See, my hand stayed central to this line. It's not going to be perfect. But watch. It didn't go like that. So, notice when I step forward, I bring this foot with me. And then it comes back. Some people just do this and they've left this leg back here. You got to bring that with you so you take your whole torso into the target. Okay, same thing on this side. Now, if you're in a front stance and you want to advance forward, now this stance is too narrow, it should be wider. So I'm going to exaggerate the stance because if I was standing on a Mui Fa Jong, the dots are going to be symmetrical, they're going to be in line. The dots are going to be in line, they're not going to be all askew. So, if I'm in a front stance, I take a half step forward, see? But I keep the same. When you do this, you develop your home stance. And everyone's home stance is going to be different. And you test that by standing somewhat narrow and have somebody push you. And you're going to lean. And then eventually you're going to go have to catch your balance. When you get to that point where you're stably strong, that is your personal home stance. Everyone's home stance is going to be different based on their muscular skeletal structure, okay? So this is too much for me, but I'm going to do it to give you an idea of the straight track, like a railroad track. So I'm in a front stance, and so you stay on the track. See? Going back, you stay on the track. You don't narrow your stance, your base. So now that you know this is too wide for me, I'm going to do it my distance. My distance is about right here. So I take a half step forward, half step forward, half step back, half step um, back. So half step forward, half step back, half step forward, half step back. You can do two half steps forward. You can do three, ten, whatever it takes. Those are some drills you should do to build up your cardio, build up your calf muscles and your quads. 
but you need strong legs to propel yourself into the target. Since we don't have wind-up punches, we have to generate power from somewhere. And our engine is pushing forward. So that's why doing that exercise I showed you called running the horse, where you go up and down around a room, back and forth, to, de to develop that thrust forward, that push forward. Okay? So, when you're a beginner and you're just learning, you might step and punch, step and punch. And you can do two punches, ten punches, fifty punches with each step. It doesn't matter. But here's what I want to show you now. You do one for, for the cardio and the strength training and the structural training. But really, even in a front stance, forget my hands. I don't step forward. I do see so I do a U shape see before I step forward forget the hands so I'm on this line right see so so I don't commit so if I just step forward and something happens I'm committed to land in a certain spot but if I do a little bit of a circle, I can change. Aha! Thank God for Wing Chun. Okay? So if I do a little bit of a circle, so I don't really have to pinch now because so, I have something slippery here. That's good. Good training for me. So if I step forward and the situation changes, I'm committed to land here. But if I do a little bit of a circle, I can go back that way. So maybe I want to check it and I have to change. Or maybe I want to step forward and I have to step deeper. But if I just go here, gravity dictates where I land and I don't want that to happen. So the best way to practice, let me step over here away from that slippery spot. So I'm in a front stance. One, two, three. Step back. Watch. So I'm going to exaggerate it. I'm making a U. But when you do it, you minimize it. Once you've done it so many times, it becomes internalized so that you'll know. See, so I'm fighting. See what I did? See, I, d I didn't just go and commit because I could be f stepping into a punch, a kick. Um, the guy could, as soon as I come out, the guy could pull out a knife. And now, uh oh, I ha I'm cut. I have to move back. But if I do this, I can move away. See, if I do this, I can move back. See? But if I commit, it's too late. So remember when you're doing front stance? It's a good drill to do. Circle. Exaggerate it first. And then later on, see? So someone who doesn't know, it may look like I'm just doing this, but I still have that little interruptibility potential there. See? Okay, so let's try from here. So I'm in a front stance. See? See? I make it shorter. But when you're first learning it, exaggerate. Oh, close hands. Now also, watch. There's, if there's an opponent in front of me, I don't want to go right in this middle. I want to angle. So... You look at this line, see, and then come back here to, to start the drill over again. Of course, in combat, you would do something else and keep going. But since, since this is a repetitive drill, you come back to your starting point. So I'm using this line again. Watch. Or let's look at this. This is the line of attack. If the person threw a straight kick or straight punch at me, this line here, I don't want to stay on the line of attack. So, see what I'm doing? Watch my feet. I move off a little bit. Now, most of you have just learned straight up and down. And that's really basic, but that's not good for combat. And then come back. So here's the line of attack. I want to get off the line of attack. Attack my opponent at an angle. If I'm in a front stance, I want my lead toe 
pointing diagonally away for a few reasons. One, if it points straight at you and someone side kicks my knee, they're going to break it. Plus, my, the line to my groin would be harder to cover. Plus, the shin bone's exposed. It's a hard bone. If I turn it here, uh, like a system like um, Lao Ga, they used to, they do a lot of leg kicks. So I want the guy to kick me here, in the fleshy side of my leg, not that bone. So I turn my toe in. Plus, if you do side kick my knee, I have some give. See? So you stop my knee, I have some give. I'm not going to break it. But if it's here, my leg is broken. See? If I point straight at you. So this way, at least I can, you know, absorb the kick. Plus, with my knee here, you kick in my groin, I can cover. See? Here's going to take a longer time to close. You already have the muscle set to go that direction. And every millisecond counts if you're going to get kicked in the nuts. You don't want to waste any time covering that area. So, let's work on this one now. So, f for advanced and beginners. T-step. Circle. See what I did? Forget the hands. T-step. Circle. So, T-step in Wing Chun can be here, here, here. Doesn't matter. It's a T, the letter T. It's not an L like this. It's an actual T, like this. It's not out here. See? So, T. All styles have this stance, most styles. Karate, they call it a back stance. You see a lot of karate people, they do this stance as a back stance. It's the same thing. Because most of this comes from Fujian province, China. From there to other parts of China, Okinawa, Japan, same old stuff. So, from the side neutral stance, T, circle to a front. Come back. Now watch this for footwork. T, circle. Come back with the T facing that way and back to the side neutral. Let me use this line, it might help me. T, circle. Um, come back. I came off the line. T, circle, come back, and back to the line. You're not going to be exact. But T, with my foot pointing this way, circle to a front stance. Step back with the T pointing that way, back to the side neutral. Got to do that step back. From here, you take a step back, then do this. Sorry about that. Okay, so I can step in front, I can step in front and do it. Now, before I step behind, circle stepped here and went out now I can step in front I did it this way you could do it this way it all depends on your spacing so it doesn't matter which way you do it so from here circle step in front now then here okay Step in front or step in back. It doesn't matter which one you do. So I'm going to alternate. In front. 
and back. Either way works, okay? <laughs> 